Hello and welcome to Quartalite, your car brochure channel. And in today's episode, it's part five of the Leyland Cars All Model Catalogue. Welcome back, and if you're new to Quartalite, we're a car brochure channel here on YouTube looking at car brochures from around the world from the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s and sometimes beyond that as well. So if you're interested in cars, car brochures, car knowledge, car facts, please consider subscribing. There's something for everyone and it is completely free. Anyway, back to today's episode. Amazingly, we're up to part five of this Leyland Cars all model catalogue. One of my favourite brochures actually when the Leyland car range was vast. We even did a little bit of a poll, and there seems to be a lot of interest in these 70s Leyland cars too. Anyway, let's throw up the brochure and see what we're up to. So just a quick recap, episode one, we kind of like talked about this front cover, and we looked at the Mini in that episode. And we talked about how vast the range was. It went all the way from the tiny but loved Mini, all the way up to the Daimler limousines in this brochure. Now, we've not got as far as the Daimler limousines yet. Obviously, that's going to be the last episode, but it shows you what a vast array and really a car for everyone that Leyland cars were producing at the time. But of course, Leyland cars were hemorrhaging money at this time, so you know, maybe too many cars to look after and you know, a few possibly competing with each other which is never a good thing in part two we had a look at the maxi and princess then in part three we did we had a little bit of a look at the austin allegro and that was quite a vast range at this time including the vanden plas as i have to say um which was a huge range so that's all we really got through and then in the last episode our friend the marina and the mg which included the midget and the mgbs so that means we're now up to triumph now the strange thing about this category for triumph is they all seem to be lumped together yeah you could argue that with the mgbs we're lumping the mgb and the midget together but they're a pretty much a similar sort of car really but throughout the brochure we've had a look at you know the separate sections for a maxi with a big introduction and then talking about it the marinas section about talking about them and then the different range and that went through you know princess everything was like that now when we get to triumph these seems to be all lumped together so we've got dolomites and tr7s all lumped together so I can't think that would be a bit strange. You can't like, think you'd have Triumph Dolomite here and have an introduction about the Dolomite and then the next car in the range. Because certainly the Dolomite was, you know, if you was a, in the market for a new car, if you was looking at Dolomites, you certainly wouldn't be looking at TI7s at the same time. A little bit unusual, but I guess that's just how it is. So the top doesn't introduce any particular car. It's just talking about the Triumph range. So let's have a look at that now. So it tells us sleek elegance and outstanding comfort. Triumph production encompasses two distinct groups of cars. First are the medium sized quality saloons in the Dolomite series, beginning with the economical but fully fledged 1300 and rising in power and status to the incredible Sprint with its 16 valve award winning engine five highly civilized models based on the same four-door body shell second but certainly not least are the sports cars the sprightly spitfire 1500 and most significant of all the exciting trend setting tr7 this car has already established its name sorry a name for itself in america and is fast winning over enthusiasts in britain and on the continent so you can make your choice from seven triumphs of automobile automobile engineering everyone designed and built for the motorists who appreciates that extra individuality other cars do not have 
Main image is the TR7, which we'll come back to later, but the car was first launched in the United States in January 75. Hence, why it's you know, saying you know, it's won over American is now in um, the UK and continent, you know, in the United Kingdom. The home market, it came in May 76, or surprisingly, quite a bit later than the US. But anyway, we'll come back to the Triumph TR7 in a little bit. Let's see where the Triumph range starts. The Dolomite, and really at this time, even the Dolomite had quite a vast range. That's kind of like why you'd think, you know, there would be a separate section just for the Dolomite, but no. But it starts with the 1300, the base model, so let's have a look at the description for that. And one thing you will notice with the much of the range in this catalogue is a lot of the range is quite aging. So the Dolomite was produced between October 72 and 80. And yeah, it's certainly got some more life left in this particular model yet, but you find most of them are aging models. I guess the exception is something like the TR7, which was relatively new in this brochure. Anyway, the base model, the 1300, tells us luxury and economy are major ingredients of Triumph's small sporting family saloon. It is powered by a 1296cc four-cylinder engine, has a four-speed synchromesh gearbox, front disc brakes with servo assistance and radial ply tyres. The precise rack and pinion steering needs only three and a half turns lock to lock. And a turning circle of 30 foot 6 inches highlights the excellent manoeuvrability of this easy to drive family car. The seats are upholstered in expanded vinyl and the front squabs are reclinable. Front head restraints and inertia reel seat belts are fitted. A facial warning light indicates when the seat belts are not fastened. The Dolmite 1300 has twin reversing lights, laminated windscreen, heated rear window, radio speaker and aerial, two speed windscreen wipers, and electric washers. An exterior rear view mirror is mounted on the driver's door. So, you, when you read that, you kind of like feel the Dolomite was seen as a more upmarket vehicle than some of the similar sized cars in the range here even in this very base trim I always found the Dolomite quite an attractive looking car as well and then a look in the interior and you still get that feeling that it is a little bit more upmarket really because remember this is the base 1300 and we get head restraints and what looks like a bit of a walnut style dash. Moving up the range and what always seems to be a little bit more of a popular choice, the Dolmite 1500, designed to cater for those discerning buyers who require a real value for money. The 1500 features wide opening doors and ample headroom with deep pile carpeting, walnut veneered fascia and deeply upholstered seats with luxurious hard-wearing brushed nylon facings. The front seats are adjustable fore and aft and have reclinable squabs. Storage for your oddments inside the car is catered for by lockable glove box and two full width parcel shelves, while the spacious boot with lamp and felt backed mat has a capacity of 13 and a quarter cubic feet. The main difference though of course is the engine size, a 1493cc twin carburetor engine developing a healthy 71 bhp at 5500 revs per minute and a 4 speed synchromesh gearbox, overdrive is available as an optional extra giving it a lively performance yet economical enough for the more thrifty owners. Apologise this one is unfortunately on the crease. Shown here in what was a very popular colour in the 70s actually and I saw a lot of Dolomites in this brown. You can't like forget how popular brown used to be as a colour and I kind of like starting to like it again actually. Mirror though looks like it's been tacked on uh, from like the parts bin at Halfords. Doesn't really match somehow but we'll have a look in the interior. This particular model featuring an all black interior. 
but of course, the doll knight had opening quarter lights. Although I guess you could argue opening quarter lights is really showing like this is becoming an aged model as well. We could move up to the HL for a bit more fancy features. The interior is finished to the same high standard as the 1500, but with the important addition of many extra fittings and refinements. The comprehensive range of instruments and warning lights include tachometer, battery condition indicator, water temperature and fuel gauges. Everything is provided for your safety and comfort and the attention to detail borders on the fastidious. Head restraints, heated rear window, laminated windscreen, two-speed wipers and electric washers. The driver's seat is adjustable for height as well as fore and aft. The steering column for length and rake. In addition, there are walnut veneer door cappings, grab handles, centre rear armrest, stretch pockets on the front seat backs, clock, cigar lighter, radio speaker and aerial. With its distinctive style, the 1500HL offers excellent value for money. And with that twin headlight setup, they really looked very different, didn't they? This little bit of a vinyl rear quarter section here looks good in this yellow colour as well overriders I think it's strange how in the description it doesn't sound very much but when you see the picture itself it looks very different to the lower models in the range interesting wheel setup there as well on the inside we get this sporty looking uh, wheel with dolomite on the centre hub there walnut dash and lots of gauges as we turn the page we get the top dolomites and then we move on to the spitfires and the ti7 but let's look at the 1850 hl and sprint so the dolomite 1850 hl and sprint at the top of the triumph dolomite range of compact luxury saloons are the 1850 hl and sprint the 1850 hl has an overhead camshaft slant four engine of advanced engineering design giving the car really sporting performance suspension is independent at the front four link live axle at the rear coupled to front and rear anti-roll bars for sports car handling with saloon car comfort the full width air spoiler below the front bumper provides an extra degree of high speed stability standard equipment in line with triumph's value for money policy is comprehensive and then the Dolomite everyone aspired to own. The Sprint's 1998cc engine has four valves per cylinder, operated by a single overhead camshaft, and delivers 127 bhp at 5700 revs per minute. The four speed synchronized gearbox has overdrive on third and fourth gears. The Dolomite Sprint continues to prove its potential with class wins in both racing and rallying and then a look at the 1850 hl sort of like the luxury model although specifications very similar to that previous 1500 hl rather like this color and just a reminder that leyland cars had a really nice color palette in the 70s you even got a bit of a gold line going through there very fancy i think the main difference between this and the 1500 apart of course from the engine itself was like it says in the description this little bit of a spoiler there to identify it from the 1500 version moving on a look at that rather nice looking but possibly dating dashboard and a tiny little image of the sprint and it doesn't even look like a production sprint it looks like some kind of test vehicle which again is strange a you think you'd have an extra section for the sprint really because it was a very special car but it's just a tiny paragraph and this tiny little image of a test vehicle does that not seem strange to you it certainly does to me now of course the the full range brochures like these Leyland car full range brochures like this obviously each model had its own little brochure this brochure is from 77 for the Dolomites like the main brochure 
and when you get to the sprint yeah it does have actual pictures of a production sprint so you strangely didn't actually include that and remind that these had alloy wheels which i think was possibly a little bit of a first for leyland cars but it does also show that more what i was going to call a test car but i think it's more of a a race car spec by the looks of it so unusual that the like selling it more like this rather than telling you more about this i think i think that would have been a better picture to show personally but who knows but anyway what i'm trying to say is they didn't make much of a big deal about the sprint where i think they really should have done because it was a great car after all and certainly even if you was just getting a base model dolomite this is the car that you would really aspire to one day on i think so that is the dolomite range and then strangely at the bottom they kind of add the rest of the range at the bottom the spitfire and the ti7 as what seems to be a bit of an afterthought particularly when you think the ti7 was a relatively new car so you'd probably think you'd want like a full paid spread on that maybe that's too sensible anyway we'll look at the spitfire 1500 so all we get for the Spitfire 1500 is the Spitfire 1500 is every compact inch a sports car in the great British tradition. A car that is not only fun to drive, great to be seen in and so good to look at but immensely practical and reliable. Powered by Triumph's well proven 1493cc engine, fitted with twin carburetors and developing 71bhp. The Spitfire 1500 not only has superb performance, but can boast value for money fuel economy. For the money, the Spitfire is one of the most exhilarating cars on the road. Whether you choose the snugly tailored soft top or the smoothly styled hard top version. Rain or shine, it gives you more fun and enjoyment per mile and per pound than most anything else on wheels. And there is our little image of the Spitfire 1500 and by looks of it Spitfire 1500 interior. Strangely, I guess you could also argue this was a competition for the MGs, wasn't it? Which didn't make much sense, but I think I actually preferred the Spitfire. Anyway, moving on to the TR7. The TR7 is the latest in a long line of sporting triumph and totally new concept in sports car design. It's a car designed to conform very strictly to existing and future legislation on safety and pollution, to be economical on petrol, to be comfortable as a luxury saloon. To this end, a stylish aerodynamic, aerodynamically efficient body shape was chosen with many built-in safety features. From its low speed impact absorbing bumpers to its crush resistance roof. A two litre version of the Dolma engine is used, an engine already noted for its power to weight ratio. The TR7 is unashamedly a two seater with no useless small seats in the back there is maximum room in the front and probably has one of the most comprehensive instrumentation layouts of any sports car on the road typical brochure that isn't it if it had seats in the back they'd be making a big deal about oh we've even got little tiny seats in the back for children but this one doesn't have any seats so it's saying great it doesn't have any seats in the back what a great idea there's more room in the front very um, car brochure written we get this rather nice version in white i always loved the ti7 design actually i know after the ti6 everyone was all like oh, rubbish you know small engines silly design but as a kid in the 70s i think these were the most fantastic design in the world um, have a look at the interior these fantastic seats i really love the interiors and the fabric seat colors that they actually chose for the ti7 so yes i mean these big brochures were really just a glimpse of the models uh, they were proper full thick brochures for each model like we've looked at for the dolomite um, similar sort of story for the other models as well like the spitfire had their own brochure and of course the TR7 as well but I'm still a little bit surprised to be honest with you that it didn't make more of a big deal particularly about that sprint 
don't know, almost like an afterthought, which is surprising. And even the TR7, as it was a relatively new model. So the Triumph specifications, all kind of like lumps in this tiny writing at the back here. The Dolomites, the Spitfire and the TI-7. We'll probably just have a quick look at some of these specifications as it does get a bit wordy. So it starts by lumping the 1300 and the 1500 together, telling us the 1300 is a 1296cc um, with a 58bhp at 5500 revs per minute and the 1500 with a 1493 cc 71 bhp at 5500 rpm and then the options for the 1300 was just tinted glass for the 1500 you could have tinted glass or an overdrive on the hl version you could have tinted glass overdrive or indeed an automatic transmission so we get the dolomite 1850 hl and sprint together here so the 1850 and an 1854cc producing 91 bhp and that fantastic sprint at a 1998cc producing 127 bhp i think originally the sprint initially was just going to be called the triumph dolomite 135 because of how much was the claimed bhp but even in the notes here it's only producing 127 which is probably why that name didn't stick Anyway, moving on, optional extras for the 1850HL was overdrive and an auto transmission. For the Sprint, you could have automatic transmission and a limited slip differential. Moving to the Spitfire 1500 that had a 1493cc engine, producing 71bhp. Looks like the only option at this time was to have overdrive. And then the TI-7 with a 1998 CC, uh, looks like it's got 105 bhp. I do believe actually in 77, although it certainly doesn't say in this brochure because they're probably very rare and only about 62-ish Triumph TI-7s were built. The Triumph TI-7 Sprint, using that Sprint engine, some more bhp. But I think once the Speak assembly plant closed in 78, that was kind of like cancelled. Hence, so few of those were built. Uh, but anyway, I'm going off track. Moving down to the bottom. We could option it to have a five-speed gearbox. Interesting, because obviously standard, they just came with a four-speed gearbox. But there we can have a five-speed automatic transmission and a fabric sunroof. Next week, Rover. So there we go. I hope you've enjoyed part five of this Leyland Cars all model catalogue. My favourite this week of the Triumphs, I think is that Triumph Dolomite Sprint. It's just a little bit of a shame they didn't make more of a deal of it in this brochure. Anyway, which was your favourite? And I hope you're looking forward to Rovers next week. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, if you've not done already, please do indeed consider subscribing. It's completely free, helps the channel and helps you see episodes when they come up. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of episodes on Quartz Light now. And that is growing every day. And I appreciate everyone who has subscribed. And of course, those people that constantly um, comment, I read everyone and I find them really fascinated. Lots of very knowledgeable people out there. So for now, we'll say take care. I hope you enjoyed the rest of your week. All the best and goodbye.